Thank you so much, and thank you all for coming. Um, I see a lot of familiar and unfamiliar faces out there. So, <coughs> the Federal Music Project and its enduring legacies. We seem to live in times plagued with high employment rates, unemployment rates, and an economy that just will not heal or rebound from recession, and despite whatever the politicians may say to the contrary. So during the past couple of years, you might have read an occasional editorial in the country's newspapers exhorting President Obama and the federal government to heed a lesson from the country's history and adopt an aggressive stimulus plan on the scale of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Works Progress Administration. Inaugurated in 1935, the Works Progress Administration replaced the more limited endeavors of the earlier New Deal with projects like the Civil Works Administration, or the CWA. And during the eight years of its existence, from 1935 to 1943, um, this project spent over $11 billion in 1930s currency to employ over 3 million people from all walks of life, ranging from construction workers to nurses to clerical workers and artists. Most importantly, at least most importantly for our purposes today, <coughs> that WPA also included uh, something known as Federal One, which were work relief <coughs> programs in music, fine arts, theater, and writing. And the government spent probably approximately about a billion dollars in 1930s currency during those years to support the arts in various forms. And many of you have probably heard of the <coughs> WPA Art Project and perhaps seen some of the murals or mosaics that were completed with the support of the WPA. Interestingly, of these four relief programs in the arts, the Federal Music Project was actually the most expansive program. So, it financed group lessons for the public, lectures on music history, music theory classes, symphony orchestras, choirs, operas, dance bands, composers, forum laboratories, and even what they called a few ethnic ensembles. All right. Its performative work was conducted mostly in the large metropolitan centers like New York or Los Angeles, but its educational programs and musical outreach extended to even remote areas of the Appalachian region or the South. So if you just look at this slide here, New York City, um, being a metropolitan center, had several orchestras, had opera, chorus, magical singers, um, composers, foreign laboratory, lectures, I mean, a whole slew of events, whole slew of performances, and, and basically event things that you could go to, as well as group lessons for the public. A smaller center like Glendale, California, right near us, um, had a concert orchestra, they had a Mexican Tipica orchestra. They also had like whatever they could find, military band, Hawaiian ensemble, um, a hot dance band, and most <laughs> regions had dance bands, um, and a choral unit, all right? So, you might ask this, why is it that so many of us have never heard of the Federal Music Project? When general historians speak of the WPA, music is almost never mentioned. And musicians and musical organizations also keep silent about the WPA's role in their own personal and institutional histories. And there have been a few survey studies of the WPA by scholars such as William MacDonald, who you saw before, and, um, and a notable monograph by Kenneth Bindis on, it's called All This Music Belongs to the Nation, right, about the WPA Federal Music Project. But in general, there is ignorance and silence about musical work done in the New Deal program, the WPA, even amongst the musicians and musical scholars. So today, I hope to sort of reach that wall of silence by sharing with you some of the discoveries I made at the Library of Congress, at the New York Public Library, and at our own Denison Library and at Scripps College. And I have to say, I have to give, start by giving thanks to the librarians because um, this work was greatly assisted and spurred on by the previous cataloging work and preservation work done by the librarians at these institutions. And a couple of them actually clued me in to the existence of these um, uh, archives in the first place. And that's, um, that's Judy Harvey Sahak, told me about the Lee Patterson papers. And uh, George Boswick, uh, who's a librarian in New York Public Library, told me, hey, you should go look at the letters of the composers from the laboratory. So, let me start there. So I'm going to start, but I'm going to basically talk about three things. Symphony orchestras, the composer's foreign laboratory, and music education. So let me start with the symphony orchestras. 
1930s saw many instrumentalists left unemployed by the conversion of theaters, movie theaters, from the old format to the talkie format. And you know, moreover, even musicians who had had um, jobs in local civic orchestras lost their jobs because these orchestras had been uh, established during a more prosperous time, and the orchestra folded because of the lack of financial support. So the WPA's primary role was to give work relief to people, and, and, and to the credit of those who envisioned this project, the work relief was to be in the area of the person's expertise rather than general unskilled manual labor. And the federal project, federal music project's mandate was to find beneficial work for all those unemployed instrumentalists. And the federal music project focused much of that employment in symphonic and concert music, uh, which is hardly surprising, considering that the project's national director from its inception in 1935 to 1939 was Nikolai Sokolov, who was the former conductor of the Cleveland Orchestra. Right? So in New York City alone, which was already, which already had a thriving music scene, the WPA supported seven additional concert and symphony orchestras in 1935. And here is a slide from Brooklyn. Uh, and Brooklyn was one of the five or six symphony orchestras sponsored by the WPA. Yeah. And other cities with major private symphony orchestras like Boston, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Pittsburgh, Chicago, San Francisco, Cleveland, Denver, Detroit, right? Big sort of musical centers at that time. They were also supplied with additional symphony and concert orchestras during the WPA years. And here's a program from Philadelphia, the Civic Symphony Orchestra Concert, um, University of Pennsylvania Irvine Auditorium, I believe. Um, you know, so this is like in addition to the famous Philadelphia Orchestra, or the one in Illinois, Illinois Symphony Orchestra, as opposed to the Chicago Symphony, but still an additional orchestra in the same area. Okay. So many cities and states that had never had a symphony orchestra before were provided one during the Depression. So these included smaller cities like Albany, Bridgeport, Jacksonville, Grand Rapids, Providence, Springfield, San Bernardino, <laughs> and states such as you know, Minnesota, Oklahoma, New Jersey, and Wisconsin. And cities such as Kansas City that really could not find enough qualified musicians, qualified unemployed musicians, I should say, for a big symphony orchestra were provided with a concert orchestra. And you can see two programs here, one co-sponsored by the Music Teachers Association um, at, held at the Jewish Community Center, um, and another sponsored by the Federation of Musicians. The musicians in general got along pretty well with the WPA, at least the, the unionized musicians. Okay. So symphony orchestras, now that were founded earlier in the century, but you know, basically <coughs> left to languish during the Depression, like the Portland Symphony, the Omaha Symphony, they were given renewed life in the 1930s through the WPA orchestras in these cities. So this would enable musicians uh, to stay in their profession and continue to use their musical skills, right? So by the project's end, pretty much 1942, although official end date is 1943, one of the noted accomplishments of the project was the increased technical ability of the musicians that they employed. And, and this was noted in state several, uh, several state reports. Many of the musicians employed by the various projects were actually mediocre or marginal in skill level. And they were perhaps only accepted into the project because of sympathetic audition boards. However, well, you know, you have a guy out of work and you want to give him a job, right? However, these musicians were given the opportunity to rehearse and play challenging repertory in the company of many other musicians who were indeed top-notch musicians who had just indeed fallen on hard times. So for these sort of mediocre players, the rehabilitation provided by the WPA was in fact a training program so that they were better musicians at the end than when they started. And other orchestras and orchestra societies that were struggling during the Depression, such as the Syracuse Symphony, founded in the 1920s, um, it's right here, the San Diego Symphony Orchestra, Wilmington Symphony, they found a new source of hope in the financial and organizational support provided by the WPA Federal Project. Okay. Most notably, however, the WPA helped found several symphony orchestras that continue to exist as independent organizations after World War II. 
The Greater Bridgeport Symphony, first founded as a WPA orchestra in 1936, was disbanded during the war. But its initial founding caused local civic organizations and local musicians to incorporate it again in 1945 into a symphonic organization. And you know, this is just a picture from the orchestra's history on the web. A similar story could be told of Hartford, where the residents in cooperation with the WPA founded a symphonic organization in 1936. Can you believe that, you know, middle of the depression. The Buffalo Symphony, now Buffalo Philharmonic, was formed as a CWA orchestra in 1934. And then, um, with a sort of society, a civic organization, um, they founded the Buffalo Symphony Philharmonic Orchestra in 1935, 1935, 1936. So um, in this case, the original conductor, La Jo Shook, right, was brought in by the local civic organization to conduct this orchestra, <laughs> fledgling orchestra. But he was eventually replaced by a different conductor named Franco Autori. Autori. And Autori actually came in as a guest conductor under the auspices of the WPA. And here is a letter I found. The musicians, every single musician in the orchestra, wrote a letter to Lee Patterson, um, the regional director. Lee Patterson, who eventually came to Scripps, by the way. Yeah. All right. And he, and they basically wrote saying, we want Franco Autori. So please help us get him, because he's, he's better at dealing with the orchestra. He's a better conductor. We want him. So guess what? In subsequent years, it's Franco Altori who's the conductor of the orchestra. And it's, this is a great program because you have um, a concert where you're, you have a guest soloist, Benny Goodman. I mean, they had a lot of sort of guest artists like that performing with the WPA. Okay. Um, okay. Finally, the WPA operated a Utah State Symphony between 1935 and 1939. And with the curtailing of federal funds in 1940, the Utah State Institute for the Arts, along with the Utah State Symphony Organization, and these are private organizations, right, stepped in to co-sponsor with the WPA a Utah State Symphony, okay, which was later to become, of course, the famous Utah Symphony. And as in the case of Buffalo, it was the WPA organization that found a suitable um, conductor, a Hans Henia, and that worked with the Musicians' Union to make such an institution possible. I mean, although it seems like there was some friction between the WPA and the local sort of private organizations, but they basically worked together to make this happen. Okay. And in all these cases, the federal project worked in cooperation with the local civic group that hoped to sustain a major institution in their city. And um, in the Federal Music Project encouraged this kind of boosterism in the hopes that they would continue these organizations after, um, afterwards, in the future, indefinitely into the future, which certainly happened in a lot of the cases. So there's a quote I found um, from a speech made by Earl Moore, who became the director of the Federal Music Project in 1939. And he's uh, addressing the Music Teachers National Association, very powerful organization, by the way. Okay, and he says this, <clears throat> one type of community service which can be rendered by performance units of the WPA Music Project lies in the development of policies of cooperation with existing organizations engaged in the same activity. In accordance with the basic philosophy of the community <coughs> approach, it is to be hoped that civic or community orchestras of adequate symphonic proportions may be developed or that struggling civics orchestras may be assisted in carrying out the responsibilities by coordination and cooperation with WPA orchestral resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the assistance of the WPA to the symphonic orchestras was not only in paying musician salaries, right? As noted before, um, the WPA often managed the organizational work required to put together an orchestra, finding a good conductor, negotiating with the musician's union, um, which actually, as I said before, supported the WPA usually, and the Civic Booster <coughs> Arts Organization. And finally, the WPA helped foster local support by press releases, editorials that supported these endeavors. <coughs> And you know they were continually flooding the papers with press releases. Um, people were writing in editorials all the time. Okay, I'm going to turn now to the Composers Forum Laboratory. 
Now, during, if you know anything about American music history, during the 20s, you had these young group of American composers centered in New York City and some music critics that say, America has arrived and Americans should listen to the music of American composers as opposed to Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms. You know, it's the same story, okay? And composers formed various organizations to promote their cause, and the most notable of these was something called the League of Composers. And you know, some of the leading American composers of the day, some names that you might recognize, like Aaron Copland, Virgil Thompson, Roger Sessions, um, Henry Cowell, they participated in the League and contributed articles to the journal called Modern Music, um, which pretty much unabashedly promoted the music of American composers, American music, right? Thus, when the Federal Music Project took over the multiple musical ensembles that had been previously organized by the CWA, they added a composer's forum laboratory. Now, as the word laboratory might indicate, it was sort of an experiment in populism. All right. The purpose of the forum laboratory was, quote, to provide an opportunity for serious composers residing in America, both known and unknown, to hear their own compositions, to test the reactions of auditors, to benefit by a public discussion of their works. And each forum, se its forum session featured live performances of that composer's music, followed by a period where that composer would stand up and answer questions from the audience. And each program contained a little space on the bottom on which an audience member would write in a question. They would tear it off and send it to the front. So that would be read during the forum. And you know, many different styles of composition were featured. Um, notably absent, I have to say, though, were jazz pieces, show tunes, and other music by what they considered more commercial composers. All right? um, but, so it was sort of like a forum for serious academic composers, all right, um, ranging from people like Aaron Copeland, right, and Roy Harris. This is, next one is Roy Harris. Um, it's taking a little while to load. It's a, um, this is actually the typed program, right? Um, by the way, during the 1930s, Roy Harris was just as well known, if not more well known than Aaron Copeland. Um, we forget that now, you know. Um, two unknowns, like graduate students at Juilliard or Hunter College or something like that. But the forum period did allow for some frank questioning and audience members were given the opportunity to challenge the composers on their compositions. So, you know, one audience member asked the composer Bernard Wagoner, can Mr. Wagner explain why he abandons the cadences and why he leaves dissonant chords in the air without resolving them? <laughs> and you know, he replied, there are a great many dissonances that do not need any resolution. <laughs> so, so no apologies were issued for this modern sounding music, but the people were given a chance to air their negative reactions to any of the music, right? Um, the more prominent composers were featured during a highly publicized uh, annual series of concerts entitled the Festival of American Music. And if you can, um, whoops, okay, going back to this, I mean, who's that on the cover? George Washington, I mean, there's like patriotism, of course, during <laughs> George Washington's birthday, right? right? Um, so from the viewpoint of the composers whose works were featured in the series, this experiment of concert you know, discussion was really successful. The series not only provided a, a, a performance venue for their works, but it also situated the uh, composer as the great hope for the future of American music. Right? And the success of the forum in New York inspired other cities to start their own composers forum during the WPA era. I have to say the forum did cease to exist in 1942 uh, because of the war, right? Um, but its success has allowed Ashley Pettis, who had founded it, right, to continue the series in the post-war years. And here, I'm going to show you a program from 1947. I think this is a, when it first gets started again, uh, under the auspices not of the WPA now, but New York Public Library and Columbia University, and with like an illustrious advisory board. Carlton Sprague Smith, Aaron Copeland, Virgil Thompson, William Schumann, the critic Olin Downs, who was really powerful in the 30s and 40s. Um, and this composer's forum would continue in various guises until it petered out 
you know, much, much later, and gave way to other composers' organizations, which many of which bore the same name, and which, which recalls his first endeavor, you know, uh, that was organized by the WPA, funded by the WPA, all right? And indeed, other organizations with the same name would spring up in different cities during the second half of the 20th century, including the Minnesota Composers Forum, which now is called the American Composers Forum. It's a huge organization now. Um, but it harks back to the 1930s and the WPA years. All right. So I'm going to turn, ge change gears here now and turn to music education, because that's actually, I find, one of the most fascinating things about the project. So, in certain respects, the music, music, music education was alive and well during the <coughs> Depression. I mean, the fact that the directors of the Federal Music Project had to go and speak to the Music Teachers National Association on a regular basis mm -hmm. meant that they, they had political power, and they had to assure these employed musicians that the WPA was not going to reduce their earnings, right? So, any student who actually wanted to take lessons in the WPA had to fill out a form in which they certified that they could not afford to take lessons and that if they did become able to afford lessons, they would stop taking lessons in the project. You know, it was a very, um, you had to sort of certify that, okay? Um, now, this educational aspect of the project received less publicity than the concerts. Um, but its effect on communities possibly had more of an effect, um, a long-term effect. So in a special report to the President's Advisory Committee on Education prepared uh, September 15, 1937, the writer notes this, and these are just quotes I'm going to read, very interesting quotes. Project teachers in the mountain districts of Virginia report that children, who otherwise lack the means for music study, have trudged four and five miles for lessons with WPA teachers. And later in the document, it says, these teachers tell how children of sharecroppers have taken to the summer roads at 6 o'clock in the morning to get their music lessons before starting the day's work on the farm. Other classes have been held at 9 o'clock at night for adults who have worked through long days in the planting and harvesting seasons. One teacher has rigged up a trailer with a small piano and phonograph and trundles her motorized music school into isolated districts at the tail of her ancient Ford. <coughs> and a later 1942 report notes this. A man walked five miles twice each week with his two daughters for piano instruction at a unit in Paragould. Now, these poignant <coughs> descriptions of sharecroppers going to music lessons at night after a long day's work, children walking miles to study music with the WPA teachers who brought you know, music culture to such remote places in jalopies, right? Um, they were clearly propagandistic, <laughs> right? And meant to move the bureaucrats in Washington to continue supporting the project. Nonetheless, these reports were effective in noting the extent to which music education was valued by a segment of the American population that was not thought to be interested in cultural education. Right? In practice, you know, the opportunities given by the WPA accorded to this segment of the American population the right to study music for the first time. Because, I mean, what's a right if you can't actually do it? Right? So in addition to the group music lessons given to individual students, the WPA-sponsored uh, ensembles were often dispatched to public schools to perform live concerts. So if there was tight coordination with the school district, the, the teachers would prepare the students for the visit uh, with educational material and recordings provided by them to them by the WPA. And many state reports noted the dramatic effect of the music on the school children. There are also newspaper clippings about this. Um, Carl Wecker, the Michigan State Director, reported on one such concert, and I'm going to read another long quote. All right, he says this. At two o'clock in the afternoon, there stamped into the auditorium a thousand underfed, poorly dressed, unbelievably dirty and riotous youngsters from the age of seven to 17. I had visions of a barrage of spitballs and a cacophony of catcalls from this audience. Instead, when the curtains were drawn aside and the rather portly Mr. Kruger turned his beaming smile upon this audience, there was a tremendous outburst of applause and a feeling of expectancy so definite that it poured over the auditorium in a tangible wave. Mr. Kruger had something on his program to interest every student there, and when they were given an opportunity to sing certain songs with the orchestra with which they were familiar, they responded with an ear-splitting enthusiasm. <laughs> 
It has been my privilege to have heard most of the great music of the world and to have attended many concerts for both adults and children, but I have seldom been as deeply touched or impressed with the message of music as I was that afternoon. If the Federal Music Project had done nothing else than to present good music to the hundreds of thousands of school children in our country, this alone in my mind would more than have justified its, ex its existence. Now at every point during the duration of the project, one of the chief music missions of those who led or worked in the project was to develop community support and to do public relations work. Um, thoughtful consideration was given to how one might introduce certain types of music to the public. Um, music community and its supporters flooded newspapers with editorials, like I said before, and about not only about the worth of the project, but about music in general, right? And orchestras, bands, chamber musics, you know, groups, they didn't just play in schools, they played in hospitals, they played outdoor concerts in parks, and later as the nation <coughs> geared up for war, they played for army bases and navy bases. Right. Like its sister project, like the Federal Theater Project, the Federal Music Project espoused an ideal of art for the people. Um, however, the organizational organizers of the music project carefully managed to create a program ostensibly for the people and yet explicitly non-communist in outlook. Um, rather than attempting to change the political landscape uh, with the work that they did, they made a concerted effort rather to change the musical landscape of the nation by providing an, a musical education for the American public, basically. And numerous supporters refer to the work of the Federal <laughs> Music Project as lifting up the musical culture of the United States. Now, I have given papers where I have critiqued the somewhat colonialist overtones of this sort of lifting up of the underprivileged classes. But on the other hand, you have to acknowledge that this was a successful campaign, campaign to provide interesting and worthwhile musical experience to those who had had no previous access. Right? The music promulgated by the project, like especially classical music, was being uh, disseminated over the airwaves by radio, right? The commercial radio broadcasts, Toscanini, you know, people heard this in, throughout the country. But the means to a live performance or musical study, this had been barred for the majority of the American population except through the auspices of the WPA. Now, WPA officials understood the power of radio. Okay. For this reason, it sponsored many radio broadcasts each year featuring different ensembles of the WPA, um, especially in centers like New York and Los Angeles. Right? And each radio broadcast, um, if you heard it, you were confronted with the high quality of the ensembles, made up of unemployed musicians, by the way, and exposed to some new music by American composers, and, and given information on what the WPA was uh, accomplishing in your community. Um, and I'm going to play you a, a short excerpt from a 1938 radio broadcast of the Los Angeles Federal Symphony, as it was called then. It used to be Los Angeles, now it's, it's very interesting. And this was a program featuring <coughs> William Grant Skiss, still, African -American, a well-known African-American composer at the baton of this orchestra. Orchestra is white, mind you, right? Right, um, conducting his own compositions. So um, let me just go there. This is in the middle of the 15 minute broadcast. by the Federal Work Program. That's why the American people prefer work to a dole for the unemployed. A recent impartial survey revealed that 90% of the people prefer work relief. They know that WPA workers have improved their communities. they built schools, hospitals, and community buildings, tangible assets for the nation. And by providing modern sanitary facilities in rural areas, they have checked the high death toll from typhoid fever and other diseases. Never before has such a nationwide attack been made on this problem 
so vital to us all. Malaria is another scourge attacked by the WPA. Thousands of the unemployed have been kept at work, turning swamplands into beautiful parks, thus removing the breeding ground of the malarial mosquito. Surgeon General Perrin declares that in the field of malarial control alone, relief labor has accomplished in five years what it would have taken 30 to accomplish without its aid. This is only one of a hundred reasons why so many Americans emphatically endorse the Works Progress Administration. Again, we listen to the Los Angeles Federal Symphony as Mr. Still conducts the orchestra in further excerpts from his Lenox Avenue suite, the dancing drunkard and the philosopher. <laughs> continues and you know the excerpt would end and then this, this concludes the broadcast for the WPA symphony you know this, uh, WPA federal music project so very interesting um, so every single 15 minute broadcast included one to two minutes of that propaganda that you just heard about the good works being accomplished by the project and this was of course in addition to the good works that you were listening to in the music right and so as such the federal music project avoided they avoided a lot of the political battles that raged around the theater project, right? But it still participated, maybe a little bit more astutely in some ways, in the political discourse of the late depression, right? And here, I would say music was clearly on the side of the New Deal lefties, right? So I'm going to conclude with Legacies Forgotten. Interestingly, the histories advertised by the symphony organi orchestra organizations on their websites almost never credit the WPA, Federal Mus Music Project, and the work it did during the critical years of their formation. Of the symphony orchestras that I have discussed today that are still in existence, only the Greater Bridgeport Symphony proudly proclaims its WPA roots in its historical narrative. The Utah Symphony notes that it was a WPA symphony before its official founding, but actually doesn't acknowledge that it was sponsored by the WPA in its first season. And some of the official histories of Utah state documents that I encountered, actually, they don't mention the WPA at all. Okay. And interestingly, the Buffalo Philharmonic in 2008 advertised a history which acknowledged the role of the WPA in the formation, but then in 2009, they replaced it with a much briefer history with no mention of the WPA. And now, there, on their website, there is no mention of history at all, except we were founded in 1935. <laughs> no, it makes a lot of sense, right? 1935, middle of the Depression, we founded this orchestra. Hmm, how did it happen? Okay. Even the Composers Forum Laboratory, which came into existence because of the WPA, aimed to erase that history in later years. Um, once the original founder, Ashley Pettis, left the program, he left in 1951, it began to take on a different character, um, such that in 1962, you know, Pettis, he's writing to the director at that time, Frank Wigglesworth, he would complain like this. In the arrangement of programs, the public must also be taken into consideration. Consequently, variety, both in matter and manner, becomes a necessary concomitant in the choice of materials and participants. Of course, you know this already, but, and I am merely gratuitously, gratuitously um, carrying coals in Newcastle. Yet this procedure has not always been followed. Right? And Pettis really did have cause for alarm that the populist impulses of the forum's initial conception were being forsaken. You know, indeed, in the 1961 publication, uh, the 25th anniversary survey of the Composers Forum Laboratory, um, it credits the you know work of the young composers. It credits the work of Nikolai Sokolov as an individual. Um, it mentions the Federal Music Project once. It doesn't mention the WPA anywhere. So, the idealist and populist con context in which the, the Composers Forum was founded. Is practically erased from its self-history. Right? I would suggest that along with the erasure of the WPA years from the multiple <coughs> strands of American music history, there's been a loss of the rhetoric 
that successfully argued for public and government funding for the arts and of the laws that the, of the idea that music, especially music practiced at a high artistic level, has great value in a democratic society. And now there's general mourning about loss of public funding for music performances and music education, but there's been little recognition of the importance that such funding and support had for sustaining musical endeavors. So today I've tried to outline how many of the musical institutions of the second half of the 20th century, composers organizations, symphony orchestras, public music education, were actually in great part results of the assiduous cultural and educational work done by the WPA in the late 1930s. And this work was actually quite short-lived in a number of years, but it left a mark way beyond the relief it was supposed to give to the unemployed musicians. Um, it helped set up the infrastructure for the American musical landscape for the next 30, 40, 50 years. Sadly, this seems to be a history, history lesson that is clearly lost on our current Democratic president, who just proposed a cut of $22 million from the National Endowment of the Arts budget. And of course, a lesson lost on our Republican Congress, who's getting ready to slash even more funds from federal funding of the arts. So I'll, ask, I'll just conclude with this question. Whose job is it to tell them that the time is right for another WPA federal one? Thank you. Mm -hmm.